So let's keep it going, ladies and gentlemen. That was iSpace Journey to the Moon. Now we're going to switch to the next panel titled Space for Talents. What is the next generation expecting from us? So let's start it off once again by welcoming the moderator of this panel. Please welcome Mark Settis. Welcome, Mark. As the CEO of the Luxembourg Space Agency, he leads the Luxembourg delegation at the European Space Agency and represents the country in the ESA Council. And as a member of the International Academy of Astronautics, he has been the Director of Space Affairs at the Ministry of the Economy of Luxembourg since January 2014. With a background in industrial policy and eight years managing Luxembourg's relations with ESA, Mark previously worked in satellite communications, antenna manufacturing at High Tech Luxembourg SA. Mark, great to have you with us. Why don't you take a seat? <laughs> My next guest needs no introduction. You know him, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome on stage. Oh, we got you. All right, okay. All right, you're the next. I, 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 I'll have to introduce you, but I don't need to introduce this gentleman. Please welcome back to the stage, gentlemen, Do Dr. Dr. Moriba Ja. Welcome. <laughs> now, I got kind of confused. Yeah, just take, a, just take a seat, Moriba. Thank you very much for joining this panel, for sticking with us the entire day. All right. Now, this gentleman does need an introduction because he was not on stage yet. Please welcome Yaroslav Yakovsky. <laughs> welcome, Yaroslav. So he is the founding employee and managing director of Redwire in Luxembourg, specialized in mechanisms and robotics for satellite servicing, debris removal, and lunar surface operations. And Redwire was created through acquisitions of 10 companies over the last three years and has grown to 700 employees in the US, Belgium, and Luxembourg. And before coming to Luxembourg, JJ, as uh, he's also known, was a co-founder um, uh, of PIAP Space, a spin-off, and he was leading industry associated that gathered over 100 space companies and represented them in front of Polish government. He holds a degree in aerospace propulsion specialty and second in finance and accounting. He is also alumni and lecturer at the International Space University and as a side hustle, as if that weren't enough, he has fully he has a fully vegan specialized coffee shop in Germany. That is interesting. <laughs> JJ, why don't you join us? So, and next up, please welcome these two young talents, ladies and gentlemen. We have Carolina Brawa de Moraes and Tahia Dalili. Why don't you join us both? Yeah, give it up loud. Now, they are part of a fantastic program called Astronaut for a Day, organized by the Luxembourg Space Agency in collaboration with the Ministry of Economy, the Ministry of Education, and the Ministry of Sports. The national competition Astronaut for a Day aims to promote the space sector in particular among young people. The competition is open to all young people aged 13 years old minimum and who are enrolled in a school in Luxembourg. And the different stages of the competition are inspired by the selection process for professional astronauts used by space agencies around the world. And the Astronaut for a Day Luxembourg competition consisted of, among other things, of tests of logical and also physical abilities. And uh, this was organized between March and July 2023. And here are two of the best. Great to have you with us. Why don't you join us? Thank you. So this should be an interesting panel. Mark, it's all up to you. And we'll be back with the Q&A afterwards. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, before we go into the discussion, I think it's important to recall how important it is, of course, to have the right talents when we develop uh, very, ambitions, uh, very ambitious missions, uh, but not only. And uh, we know particularly in the space sector um, how difficult it may be to, uh, to attract and uh, to find the right talents. Um, I would be interested also to know in the room who is today a student or a young graduate. Can you raise your hands? Okay, thank you very much. So uh, you guys who are already professionals, uh, you know that uh, you know, beside, beside Carolina and Tahir, you also have others listening to you. And maybe we can start with sharing some experience on your side. I think, Janelle, you have been quite explicit already about your career or how you, you ended up you know, uh, in the control room of uh, M1 mission of iSpace. 
I don't know if you have something to add to that. What, what would you like to share also with these young people, maybe at the stage where they have to make choices in their life, and maybe also at the point where they have to enter the professional life? What would you share with them now uh, uh, related to your experience? Sure, I feel like, um, thankfully, I have a lot of stories to be able to share because I've had, um, I'm really grateful for the career I've been able to have coming out of school. I did want to share just one other experience that I had that really was impactful to, I think, my career as a whole and what really reshaped the way that I thought about space missions. I was always kind of fearful in college that I was, you know, I'm, I'm studying to be an aerospace engineer, but what if I end up working on something that, you know, I work on for a long time and then it just gets canceled or dropped by the government and then it, it's like the hard work goes out of the window. And I was really thinking to myself, is this the right career for me? But then I joined JPL and I got put on this mission called the Cassini Mission to Saturn. And frankly, it changed my life. I didn't know much of anything about Cassini when I was put on it, let alone that it was this historic feat of humankind being able to get so far away and stay there for a long time as well. But I joined at a time when we were at the end of the mission. So what did that mean? It meant that they were going to be decommissioning the spacecraft on purpose. They were going to end the mission on purpose, and I would be there for that. And I was excited. I was like, wait, you're telling me we're going to blow this thing up on purpose? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's what we're doing. The answer was, yes, we're going to disintegrate the spacecraft in Saturn's atmosphere after diving through its rings for the very first time and then ending on one last goodbye looking back to Earth. So I remember being there at Caltech down the street early in the morning watching with all these people who had gathered and who had contributed to Cassini at some point. And by some point, I mean over its three decades of being in the making of design to actually being launched in 1997 to this moment here where it was going to be the end of the mission. And I was there and I was excited. And I'm looking around like this is the coolest thing ever. And then I watch with everyone else as the signal from Cassini which was shown on this big screen, went flat. Flat line, almost like a, a patient or a loved one. And all of a sudden, this robot went from being like this hunk of metal to what I now understood to be way more than that. As a, it was a means that had brought all these people together that otherwise may not have been. And I realized how special it was that I actually got to witness something like that. And after having a moment like that so early in my career, it kind of solidified for me that I was going to be a part of something that was greater than myself. And I will always take that with me as my Cassini lesson. Well, uh, we can hear that you don't regret that you have made these choices. Uh, and that's, that's hopefully the case for those who are sitting here, that they will do also the right choices for their career. Moriba, you, you are also, since a long time now, in in a space career or a space-related career, wh how did you get there? Was that a choice? What did motivate you to enter in this career? Yeah, no, thank you very much uh, for that question, and uh, thanks for having me on this panel. Um, you know, I would say that my entire career has been very non-traditional. Um, I went to a boarding school uh, in Venezuela for high school military school, and when I graduated from that, I came back to the United States um, and then enlisted in the Air Force. And my job was to be a security guard guarding nuclear missiles in Montana. <laughs> and um, cool. yeah, I mean, it was, and, and interestingly enough, it was like the first time in my life that I was exposed to really dark skies. And because um, in Caracas, you know, most of us live in a place with night lights that pollute the sky and on a good night you might see the moon sort of thing. So I could see dots of light going across the missile silos and I didn't know what these dots were. And every once in a while the dots of light would disappear in the middle of the sky and I thought they were UFOs. I mean, they were UFOs to me, but um, they weren't aliens. <laughs> Turns out that these dots of light were human-made objects reflecting sunlight and they would disappear when they would go behind Earth's shadow and get eclipsed. So that inspired me to want to know more, and I studied aerospace engineering. But I, I guess the thing that I want to say is this. When I got out of uh, the military to go to school to do this, I was 23 years old when I started as an undergrad, never took calculus or any of these things. And uh, my advisor at Embry-Riddle advised me against studying aerospace engineering. He basically said, 
you're too old to do this sort of thing. You never took calculus. He basically gave me the, the Yoda, the Yoda, you know, too old to begin the training kind of thing, right? He gave me, it was that sort of, uh, you know, stupidity. And the thing is, is like, one of the things that somebody told me when I was quite young is don't let other people's opinion become your reality sort of thing. And so I internalized that and I decided to go against my advisor's advice and study aerospace engineering. And it was very tough, but I guess the thing that I want to say is that I wasn't the best student. I didn't get A's. I got B's most of the time. I'm not good at standardized tests. Then at the same time, I worked at JPL. I got spacecraft to Mars. I helped ESA with Mars Express. So there's a way to do it when you are hungry enough for it and you just don't let other people's opinion be whatever your reality is. Like you are in charge of your own choices that you make. And if you're hungry and perseverant, there's not a whole lot that you can't do. Thank you, Moriba. And, and JJ, how did it happen for you? Was it also by chance or? I will, I will pull the statement a little bit fur, uh, further. So when I was 17, I did my, very early, my pilot license. Um, and what I found out is that I don't want to be a commercial pilot because it's boring, uh, very much boring when you became a commercial pilot. And then I didn't know what to do next. I had ideas from being a writer, professional writer, to study history, economy, and maybe uh, engineering. So my parents were, were very strict on this. Go to our space engineering because we, we help you to get this license. So I ended on the Uh, studying aerospace engineering and on my first year it was huge disappointment for me it was more aviation than space maybe they have one or two courses about space and in my in my mind everything what was related to aviation was already invented in 70s or 80s we you know we reached very very high speed we we fly very very high and all of this is about optimization you know fuel optimization it's it was very boring and you know like i have a problem i need to figure it out what i what i need to do and um, it was also by accident and we had this um, traits where in our university there was a bunch of students organizations that were doing and prototyping many things so i was walking around and chatting with guys And I met this very small organization of 25 people that grasped me and they asked me, build a satellite with me, with us. And I, and I asked, like, what's the satellite? And they were super enthusiastic, you know, they grabbed me, I was, I was first year, they grabbed me for a beer, uh, they, they spoke about science fiction books, they were super convenient that we will uh, have a moon village before 2040. And I was like, these guys are crazy, but I like them. Let's join them. And year after, uh, I was participating as, as you guys in a bunch of educational programs at this time uh, organized by ESA to build a student satellite, then launch uh, payloads on the stratospheric balloons, on the sounding rockets. I was second year, I, I went for three months for the internship in uh, Italy in a uh, former OHB, uh, uh, Karigovati space uh, OHB company right now. And, uh, you know, once you are there, it's very difficult to, uh, to say, okay, this is boring, I don't want to do this anymore. It was super cool. And my second experience that uh, I want to mention here, because it's important for educational progress and the value of any educational progress, was participating in an international space university in Canada for summer course. The summer course uh, is uh, organized to uh, almost to kill you, you know, under 12 weeks you have super intensive course, you meet astronauts like daily, you speak with them, you have uh, all education from maths to, uh, to, to space law, and you What's important, you, you met fascinating people from all around the world that uh, stays with you um, uh, for the rest of your life. And also, these programs are putting a lot of courage for you to start something new. And this particular pr uh, program put a courage on me to, uh, to join the new space movement that was not so popular at this time as it is right now. 
Thank you, JJ. What we can definitely hear is that you are enjoying now the career you have taken, and we hear the passion uh, behind all these words. So, Carolina Taher, what, uh, what does that inspire from your side? Uh, what, what is your motivation? Do you, do you feel the same excitement that uh, the people here just uh, shared with you? Yes, I believe um, my interest in space grew when I was very small. So it started when I was five years old and I went to uh, Cape Canaveral. And then I saw these huge rockets and all the unbelievable things. And that's when my interest really started. And then also in 2017, I had the opportunity to take part in the Asteroid Day here in Luxembourg. And then This year, as you all know, um, I was selected in the Astronaut for a Day program. So all these things have um, strengthened my interest at the end. And um, yes. Oh, well, um, for me, uh, as, as we all know, uh, this space is extremely important for, for the, our society. And also, um, for in all the aspects, overcoming challenges and um, developing technical and scientist um, Um, advance, uh, but to give you my opinion behind the, the fact that the, the 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 sector is extremely uh, inspiring and uh, and also uh, in, in terms of value ethics and, and also the impact um, for uh, for for the greatest number of activity on Earth and also um, and, and uh, on in the planet in general. But I really love the technical aspect mm -hmm. of um, of having uh, of, of taking part uh, of um, developing, uh, you know, uh, somehow to taking part uh, to doing something greater than myself, as you underlined it, um, because it is a, a, a very um, rapidly developing sector and it's very um, rewarding as well because uh, it's full of discovery and, and and to be able to bring a tiny bit of knowledge uh, and to, to express yourself um, is, is extremely interesting and, and I find it very very uh, inspiring um, to, to, do the, uh, to do that one day, yes. Well, thank you very much. We hear that you are somehow already convinced about space and the opportunity that can that, that can offer to you and the perspectives that it can offer. So, you guys, w what would you tell to someone who needs still to discover it? What would be your message to sort of motivate and interest the young generation to enter into, you know, studies that will lead to, uh, to a space career or entering a space career? What would be your messages? Janelle, you want to, ta to start? Sure. First thing that comes to mind is don't be afraid. Like, really, don't be afraid to just try things and do things. And don't think that you have to have it all figured out in some five-year plan, which to this day, I still don't have a five-year plan, in order to be able to get where you want to get. Um, human beings were risk adverse just by nature. If there's a chance that something may not go the way that you want it to go, you may decide to deal with that by just not even trying in the first place. And I can tell you right now, I mean, these two both shared their stories of how they fell into aerospace engineering, and it was quite similar for me. You might have caught it in the last talk that I gave, but I did not know I was going to be an aerospace engineer. You know, I only decided to take an introductory course because I saw the word space and I watched Jimmy Neutron, if you know that show from Nickelodeon back in the day, and I thought that space was cool, so why not? And when I went to that class, my professor was casually just going over the syllabus for the year, and he was talking about all the things we learned and showed a picture of an astronaut fixing the Hubble telescope and casually said, oh, that's me, by the way. <laughs> What? <laughs> all of my classmates already knew who this man was, but clearly I was the only one who did not. But that moment is what made everything real for me. And I could have very easily said, well, it's too late for me. I mean, I'm sitting next to people who already have their pilot's license coming out of high school. But I instead decided to think about all the things that could come from it. And that is what motivated me instead. So forget about all those doubts that you may have. The doubts should never hold you back. Instead, keep on reaching and striving for what could be instead. And I really think it's going to take you far. 
Wow, it's, it's extremely inspiring. Thank you for sharing your experience and your point of view on this. Yes. Sure. Yeah, um, I think the thing that I would like to say, right, is one of the things that I notice about the space community is that it tends to be very insular and there tends to be this sort of thing of, oh, well, you need to have a PhD, you need to be in STEM, you need to be this, you need to be that, you need to go to ISU. By the way, I didn't go to ISU. I respect <laughs> the people that did, but you know. Um, you need to go to ISU, you need to do this. And it's very clicky and it's very, it's very much the groupies and the who knows who and all that other stuff. I think that that's utter bullocks. I think it's crap. I think that there's a place in space for everybody who wants to that's be. It. I think artists, I think people that sing, that write poetry, that, that get into hip hop and rap or whatever, I think people that color, pe everybody has a stake in space because space is where we came from and space is where we need to go as a civilization. And everybody has a stake in that. Space should be no different than how we explored land, air, and ocean. There is the and space. So I think my thing to people is, look, don't get, don't get uh, convinced by the appearances that somehow you are excluded from participating in this. If you want to have any sort of role in space, there is a place for you, and you have a genuine contribution to make, and humanity needs for you to make that. Yeah, thank you, Moe. But I, I think you are, you are addressing uh, a very uh, important point: um, is really disseminating this uh, uh, into the sort of non-space community, uh, and and too many people are not aware and, and not conscious about it, mm -hmm. and and so it's a very difficult aspect as well, you know, to reach out to these people and, and bring the message that you are giving. I think, I think one of the funniest things for me, right, is sometimes I'll go to a place and I'll be the person that's going to give a talk and I like going, I like when the room fills and I go and interact with the audience before the talk starts and I just say, hey, where are you coming from? And the number of people that have no idea that I'm the person that they came to see. <laughs> and then I get on stage and I, and I look at them in the audience and their eyes are like wide open. It's like, yep, I'm a space dude. Right, exactly. It's like, so I think that's awesome. So JJ, maybe you can also add a dimension as, a, as an employer who, who somehow is looking for the, the talents. So we know that it's not always easy. So from your perspective, how, how are you uh, convincing or attracting the talents to come and work for, for your company, for example? So I think when you sell your, your, your place, right now we are in a um, in very tough um, moment for, for getting a workforce. This is like, if you go for any space conferences or ICU conference, <laughs> everyone is talking about the same. Like we, because we are developing ourselves so fast, we are missing people that could join us and they are afraid to join us because they think you need to have a PhD to work. No, you, you could be just a, a normal person, I would say. So <clears throat> I have a PhD. <laughs> I, know, I know you have PhD, I didn't know that about this. this is, it's impressive. Um, so, um, what you want to, uh, to sell these people is that, yes, you can. Uh, and it's a very attractive place uh, to work. Don't be afraid to, uh, to come and try. I can tell you that 30% of our employees, despite of the fact that we consider ourselves as a very specialized uh, robotics uh, entity, comes from, uh, uh, from interns that came that work with us three months, six months, uh, and they, they stayed. They became super great junior engineers. They became engineers, and sometimes they became a project managers in just two years. So, and many of them, they came, they uh, didn't have a great background or background that fits perfectly, but we want, wanted someone who has a, a right attitude, uh, someone who, uh, who owns things, someone who is proactive after he uh, owns things, 
and uh, uh, I call it someone who is not an asshole, you know, because it's a, it's a teamwork. Uh, Let's go with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and, it's, and it's a very important element uh, uh, because there's a lot of complex things. You want, uh, uh, you want your team to uh, dance to the same uh, song uh, uh, together. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and many things you could learn in, uh, in the place uh, where uh, you're coming to. Uh, so so that, would be my, uh, that would be my advice. This is how we are handled. We have a lot of, uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, PhD industrial programs with university <laughs> uh, where, uh, where we are looking for more, uh, uh, for more specialized people. Uh, so, <clears throat> and and uh, keep testing the, uh, the new things. <clears throat> I believe that we in Luxembourg and in general as a space community we should more promote the attitude that uh, please join us and try because there is no limits for, uh, for, <clears throat> uh, for everyone. For many things that we do in, the, uh, in our lovely space sector, there is no degree for that, there is no course for that, there is, a, there is no knowledge that is within entity and only within entity you can, uh, you can learn that. And many things that uh, for, I would say, responsibilities that we are looking for people <clears throat> to take care of, we even can define because it's a new thing, it's growing, and we'll find out in the middle. So, Caroline Otaya, what, uh, what do you intend to do? You in, do you know already if you want to embrace a career in space? And if so, what is your expectation? What would you expect from a job in, this, in the space sector? Mm. Okay, so my goal is to become a medical doctor, but also to work in the space sector. Um, my expectations would be to have an even more international um, approach. So I believe that together we can create far more things than if you are always competing against each other. Um, another crucial thing for me would be um, the working in um, working environment. So for me, it's very important um, that it's inspiring to everyone and also uh, that pushes everyone to their limits. And I think that's um, very much what everyone needs to uh, hear. <laughs> Uh, well, b before answering, I would like to come back on our, our discussion. Of course. Um, it's, it's very important that you mentioned um, all the possibilities uh, of, of, of having, of contributing to the space, because to, to, share, uh, to share with you my point of view as a, as a young pupil, as a young student, today, if you talk about space to, the, to a young uh, girl or a the boy, they, they, they they, the first thing which pops out in their mind is, is becoming an astronaut, which is True. not the only uh, possibilities. And, and I, I think it's extremely important to, um, from a higher level, to, to, uh, to, to put the space carrier and the, the, in the, all the possibilities um, a bit more in, 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 say, uh, in, in, in front um, at schools because. Um, all the schools have some um, orientation. Um, uh, there, there is some guy who are helping you to uh, orientate, and, and no one talk about the, the space and the possibilities that you have that, uh, to, to, to contribute to the space sector. And uh, yes, they, um, there's a lot of scientific um, sector, but um, they, they, they never mention, actually, that yes, you have uh, all these possibilities to contribute to the space field. Um, and then, um, well, the second point, uh, yeah, now I come back <laughs> to answer the, the question. Um, well, so what is my ex expectation um, for, for, uh, for my future job? I would love to work in a, in a supportive un environment where I can express myself uh, and, uh, more autonomously and, and to, to have this little support uh, from the companies, um, uh, private, either publics, to, to, to give the, the young students the possibility to, to, uh, to experience, to, to, uh, to experience and, and, and to, to find out uh, their way and to give them this opportunity to, to, to try it. Uh, 
Yes, this is um, what I expect, actually. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so time is running really fast. Um, I was wondering, of course, here at uh, LSA, and, and I'm, of course, talking here now for Luxembourg, uh, we are uh, engaged very much to find solutions to give these opportunities to mm -hmm. the young generation the, on the one hand, and on the other hand, of course, then to help our ecosystem to, to grow and, and continue develop. Um, so what, what advice would you give to a space agency uh, for the future uh, about the things we, we need to do? I think, Tahir, you already mentioned that probably giving a bit more information about mm -hmm. what it is, what the opportunities are, how it works. Uh, I, would, I hope that you know, the conversation today is contributing to that as well, giving some insight also from, you know, uh, people being in these careers and having some experience and, and giving some advice. Uh, I don't know. But the question is valid for every one of you. What, how do you see a role for a space agency in general? And then give me some advice what we need to do more. Look, I'm going to take that really quickly, right? I think, I think uh, as a space agency, the thing that you can start doing differently than other space agencies is bring humanity into it. Um, you know, you said an environment where they push you to the limit. I think showing people that they don't have to uh, put in 60 to 80 hours a week for work. I think uh, showing people that you honor and respect the fact that they have their own lives outside of work, uh, treating all life, family as sacred and these sorts of things, and really trying to recruit the, the, the human aspect of the person that is part of the agency, I think that's something that could be very different and could be extremely refreshing. Because I think in general, the tendency is, if you want to work in space, you got to be willing to put in 60 to 80 hours a week. You want, if you need to prove that you, you know, prove your worthiness to want to do, no, no. So I think you can do that very differently and I think that would be very attractive. Any other advice? No. I think that <clears throat> it's not only on the <clears throat> LSA or another uh, agency. It's uh, to bring and attract talents or people. It's a responsibility of this community. <clears throat> so I think what uh, what you as a LSA or another agency could do is act uh, actually to put a framework where we could support. Uh, promoting the, the space sectors and, and opportunities and its attractiveness uh, in Luxembourg, uh, in Luxembourg uh, and beyond. But you as an agency could be a <coughs> good facilitator of, uh, of this initiative. So the <coughs> someone want to take my, uh, cut my, my voice. <laughs> so, so recent uh, opportunities that we had in Luxembourg were, for example, we had open days uh, within, a, uh, within, within a companies. Those things were, I believe, helping to uh, industry to uh, proactively uh, help in uh, sort of this mission. Okay, thank you. So I think we still have a bit of time, except we see Chris coming back, so he's not there yet. So w are there questions here in the room? I'll check as well if there are questions coming from the, the remote participants. But okay. let's, let's go. I'm wondering, uh, most of the jobs that are going to be uh, created in the next few years haven't even been invented yet. You have a bunch of young people entering the workforce. What do you predict as some new career paths or job titles that will oh, yes, really cool. occur in the next five years that haven't been invented yet? How about space environmentalist? <laughs> oh, this is a good point. Mm -hmm. Like that. <laughs> Nobody else <laughs> wants to answer. Um, well, I I am really looking forward to this feature. We had the AI talk earlier today during this this event, and I remember we were just starting this conversation at JPL as well. What are the future okay. of mission operations? Mm -hmm. You, well, I, I talked about it. We're in the room every single day on holidays, on weekends. That's not exactly how I want to spend my time. <laughs> so it'd be absolutely great if we can infuse this new technology into how we do these jobs. But I will tell you right now, I do not know how to do it. 
but you are both about to go into college and you're going to have all these experiences and opportunities to learn. And you may be the ones who are fostering in, the, in this new realm of mission operations that's already started, but to take it to the next level where we have spacecraft that can decide which science is the most interesting and that's the one that's worthy to save when you have limited space on your memory. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many applications out there and if it can help make human lives a little bit better, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> So is there any, oh, please go ahead. Yeah, take the microphone. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for this conference. From a student point of view, I was wondering, um, well, there is space, there is Earth. They need engineers in space, but they also need engineers in, on Earth. So. Can we combine both of them? This is what I'm wondering. Yeah, it's called spurth engineering. I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> <Spurs>. <laughs> and, and I would say that so-called space engineer is uh, overrated. So any space engineer is an engineer with sort of specialization of uh, um, to solve uh, problems that are coming from space environment. So. It's just an extension on sort of specialization. But I, th I think more and more companies are sort of expanding to other sectors. And, and we have heard today as well with AI, AI is becoming a very important tool as well uh, to, uh, let's say, extract maximum benefit out of uh, space data, for example. Mm -hmm. And so this, this is something that is inevitably increasing in the future where, we, where you will have more and more this sort of duality of looking at the space systems, but at the same time, you have to look at the Earth systems. And, uh, and, and so, and, and I think this is also in the same direction as, as uh, Moriba said, at the end, uh, there is more than just uh, a space engineer that is needed in all these activities. And, and this is definitely something that people still have uh, wrong perception today. It's very difficult to break this sort of tradition or understanding of the people. You need really to go beyond that, inform, explain, create awareness, inspire. I mean, showing what the people are doing. Young people are engaged in very amb ambitious things. And I think this is what we need to show also to the young generation so that they understand the opportunity for them to contribute to that. Um, any other question? Yeah, no. ah. Sorry, there is a question. So, a short question. Can you see a person with an academic astrophysics background being able to contribute to the field of space industry? So, someone with an academic astrophysics background. Astrophysics. So, what do you think? In industry, say yes. <laughs> yes, I guess the problem is I'm not an astrophysicist, so I, I don't have maybe the specific information that they want. But and I say they and I see they specifically said industry because I could talk your ear off about all the ways you could contribute to NASA, and I knew astrophysicists there. Um, but also in industry as well, I think one of the great things that um, the public sector is enabling is the private sector. Uh, basically, there's all these things out there in the world and in our universe that we want to learn about. And it's going to take a lot of effort to be able to learn those things. And so to, by empowering these private companies, giving them the tools they need, the funding they need, to be able to make this new technology, I mean, the sky's the limit. We've had so many really incredible breakthroughs with astrophysics just in the past decade. I'll never forget the things like TRAPPIST-1, taking the first image of the black hole, we can start doing that in the private sector too. I'm excited for that reality. The science is at the core. It's the why we do these things in the first place. So absolutely, I think there's a future for that. I will add that uh, exactly. <laughs> Any commercial entity that uh, is building sort of scientific instrument or scientific mission for, for space agency or scientific community will be looking for specialized scientists in respective areas. So definitely there is a place for uh, someone with uh, this specialization. So any other question? Yeah, there is one there. I think you need, oh, you were first. Okay, go ahead. I have a 
feedback rather than a yeah, question. Yeah, of, of course, go ahead. So I have seen an example at BMW. They have an automotive engineering program for the fresh grads where they just need the analytical skills and they are employed and they are trained on the job. This is something we could look in Luxembourg probably and without having any degree of space engineering, we could introduce some program like this where the people who are inspired to start a step in, they could come in and, and just with the analytical skills. And this is increasing the opportunity of learning by doing, which I believe is really important where the time is also a constraint going forward in this disruptive environment. And then considering that where do we stand in general in the global economy and then how the other countries are you know, chasing for the space, for the space launches and so on. If we want to be one of the top of those uh, as, a, as a country, then I would believe introducing these kind of programs will push those boundaries for the people who are really interested in. And it would be really motivating if I look at it as a student, right? So for my child, I would rather prefer sending them to the top of the college, but rather I send directly by learning and doing and, and getting their passion out. Yeah, thank you very much for this feedback. I think this is, you are not the only one coming with uh, sort of this approach. Uh, and, um, and being inspired and motivated is definitely the minimum you need. All the rest you could probably accommodate and bring the people to a point where they can contribute you, uh, to, to you know, industry or research or other sorts of topic. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, as a student, you see that Space, one of the things that makes studying space engineering special is the multidisciplinarity. It's so many different topics, and at some point, <coughs> I'm a bit unsure or get lost. Where do you find the right balance between being an expert in a specialty in a field and having this over out of greater picture look of multidisciplinarity, understanding what the other guy is talking about who's the specialist in his domain? Where do you find the right balance to be a specialist in your field, but also have the greater picture in mind? Oh, that's a great question. That's a really great question. So sometimes you have both. Sometimes you are multidisciplinary and you are expert. It's called subject matter expert in one domain because you used to work on this uh, very much. Uh, sometimes you are, it's not just an expert. You're expert and you never work behind something or you are so-called generalist. And very often it means that you, you don't have only engineering degree, you have also business degree, and you have an overall picture of what's happening. So for example, system engineers are great examples of this type of uh, uh, being a general, and they are very much involved in all the aspects uh, within the company. Systems engineers are actually the busiest people within the firm because they can jump into engineering, but they also uh, go and write a, a business proposal and do, and do a pitching. I think it's like uh, you need to answer by yourself. What do you like to do? Do you want to be focused on one thing uh, as a person that doesn't make you comfortable to work uh, uh, on something very specialized? Or you want to grasp many things and be involved in, uh, in many areas? There is no strict answer on that, in my opinion. Any quick feedback from your side? because we're reaching the end of our slot. Anything to add? Yeah, okay, I think, I think just um, look at your joy meter. What, what, where, where, where is it that you get joy? Where is it that you get passion? And just pursue those things. And sometimes it's hard to figure out exactly what to be. And in that case, focus on figuring out what you don't want to do. <laughs> I would say, Mark, as a last statement, is that we don't need more engineers uh, for the space sector. We need more artists. <laughs> we need more writers. We need to have um, more movie directors. So we are more in impactful uh, uh, on the society. The, I don't think that any engineer or program manager impacted more the society than uh, a good writer who, who wrote a bestseller uh, and uh, bring some of us here. So if there is any writers, or if you, if, you, any, if you know any good writers, or at least medium writers, who would like to write about this, let us know. I'm sure that Moiba will fully agree with you, isn't it? <laughs> so thank you very much.
Thank you for your participation and your contribution. So I think, Chris, we ended, we are coming to the end. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for this panel here. Our young talents, talents for space, thank you very much. Mark for the moderation, JJ, Mariba, Janelle, Tahia, Carolina. All the best, continued success, and once again, the sky's the limit. Thank you very much, everybody.